Why is it important to cultivate magic and psychic abilities? If magic seems whimsical to you, then I suggest you look deeper. I'm not talking about ritual magic or religious magic. I'm talking about natural magic, attuning yourself to a layer of reality where the flow, the pulse, the making of magic is natural, not fantastical. Magic is real. You know this. You know you have extrasensory abilities. You know magic and miracles are real. So what's stopping you from fully embracing your magic? Let's take a look at the top five reasons you're blocking your magic and limiting your psychic abilities. And then we'll consider ways to release those blocks and cultivate your natural magical gifts. Obstacle number one. You block your magic because deep down you fear your abilities. And I get it. Psychic abilities have consequences. Being able to talk to the dead, having precognitive dreams, being an empath, communicating with non-physical beings, or embodying the many other extra-normal abilities can be unsettling, disruptive, draining, confusing, and sometimes scary. If you were born with active abilities, you likely had experiences as a child that were frightening and overwhelming, especially if your family didn't understand these abilities. There was no one to support you, to explain what was happening, or to guide you in how to manage your connections and energy. You may have disengaged yourself early in life from the layers of your reality where those abilities reside to spare yourself the chaos that unskilled, uncontrolled psychic abilities tend to leave in their wake. You may not even remember having these abilities at all. When I was a child, I heard trees talking to each other. It wasn't my imagination, and it wasn't fantasy. By the time I was five, I realized other people couldn't hear the trees. It was unsettling to me that everyone else lived in a reality where trees didn't talk. I learned very early to never speak of it, and I tried very hard not to hear the trees, so I could be normal and limit myself to the layers of reality that everyone else seemed to inhabit. But I'm not a child anymore, and neither are you. You can't selectively cut yourself off from magic and your natural abilities without shutting down a lot of other aspects of yourself in the process. Beautiful strengths and gifts that are part of your rich endowment in this life. The fear is real though. Sometimes you're aware of it or part of it, and sometimes it's buried quite deep always putting on the brakes to certain abilities or obscuring them entirely. Obstacle number two. Another reason you block your magic is to avoid being judged, labeled, ridiculed, or dismissed by others. Are you crazy, gullible, superstitious, credulous? I thought you were intelligent, competent, a serious person. I thought you were respectable, trustworthy, sincere. But here you are talking nonsense about magic abilities and psychic powers. Let's face it, claiming extrasensory abilities or deep magical connection isn't respectable. Prepare to have your sanity and maturity seriously questioned. You might believe you don't care what other people think about you, but let's be real. Unless you're a hermit, you are in some way part of society and a community. And if other people suspect you're crazy or idiotic, this will have an impact on the quality of your life at some point. Now, here's the truly insidious part. You've internalized this societal judgment, and you'll judge criticize, and dismiss yourself preemptively. We have all internalized this cultural rejection of anything that doesn't neatly conform 
to consensus reality. Even if we believe we fully accept magic, there's still this residual inner gatekeeper that judges some of our magic as unacceptable, a step too far. We want others to see us as sane, smart, reasonable people, but we also need to see ourselves that way, even when no one is looking. We've internalized a judge that decides that this kind of ability is okay, this much magic is okay, but that, that ability, no way. Don't go any further, because if you stray beyond an arbitrary line your inner judge has established, you deem yourself chaotic, crazy, delusional. You may be okay with energy healing, but bending time, that's crazy. If you don't truly trust your sanity, if you haven't established that your sanity is robust enough to support you as far as you wish to explore, then you will absolutely not cross the line set for you by this internal gatekeeper. Obstacle number three. This next obstacle to magic is a sneaky one. You need to know how your powers work. You feel the need to prove magic is real. Your psychic abilities are real to yourself or others. Have you ever initiated a beautiful flow of pure magic and then your mind kicks in? How did I do that? How does this work? What's happening? Is this like that thing that so-and-so wrote in that book? I also heard someone talk about in a lecture last year when I took that workshop on magic. The mind wants to grab hold of your magic, to insert itself where it doesn't belong and has no efficacy. It jumps in and gets busy defining, labeling, categorizing, adding schema, all the activities the mind loves to do. Very rarely can someone effectively codify their magic without injecting a lot of dissonance in the flow. Part of this reflex is the mind's invasive habit. It often acts like an invasive species. Another reason this happens is deep down, you are insecure about your magic and you feel compelled to prove it, to explain it, and to justify it. Which is really to say, you need to explain and justify yourself, not just to others, but also to yourself internally. This can be very obvious and pronounced or subtle and hard to catch, but there it is, needing to validate yourself, justify yourself, stop and listen. You still carry a voice inside you that says your magic is not okay. It's something weird or evil or defective or shameful or silly. Why can't you be normal? This is embarrassing. What a waste of time. When you reject your magic, you reject yourself. You can react in many ways to this internal self-rejection. You might develop a brash and defensive kind of pride and identity around being psychic or magically gifted. Or you might try to gather evidence, build your case, and constantly try to defend yourself against external or internal rejection by proving, justifying, as though this part of you, the magical part, is constantly on trial. All of this is antithetical to the flow of natural magic, and all the energy you waste could be put towards something more useful like learning how to safely and elegantly conduct the flow. We are embarrassed and ashamed to be magical, to expand so far beyond the bounds of consensus reality. It's weird, but true. We can embody that shame directly by being overtly embarrassed, apologetic, and feeling we always need to qualify prove, justify, or explain, or we might go the other route and cover it with pride, bluster, and a bombastic, magical identity. Obstacle number four. The next reason you limit your magic is fear of change. 
you know being fully magical will profoundly alter your consciousness. The notion that you'll still be the same person you are now, only you'll have these extra abilities. When you fully embrace your magic, you won't have abilities. You'll be magical. You'll be magical. Magic on the level I'm talking about is something you are, not something you do or have. It's not something you add to your existing self, like getting a new tool set. You become magical, not a dabbler or hobbyist or a practitioner, but someone whose very being is calibrated to conduct the flow of magic. Your mind, your body, and spirit are in accord with the flow of natural magic. You live in a state of unity with the natural flow of magic. You'll care about different things. You'll think different thoughts. You'll be different. Not a little, but a lot. It doesn't need to be something you broadcast to others, but internally, you will be significantly transformed. You might think that's awesome, but no. This is not incremental change. You're dealing with a different kind of combustion here. This is all chemical, and we resist becoming unless it's fed to us in seemingly manageable, incremental, predictable bites. Becoming is unpredictable. It's the dynamic union of surrender and fierce courage. Obstacle number five. Being powerful makes you uncomfortable. Power, even the word, might stir up some feelings. We might prefer the more agreeable term, abilities, to describe our magic. We've absorbed a lot of beliefs about power from the time we were very small children. We've been put in our place. We've heard that power corrupts or that it's unspiritual or greedy. What is your deep, mostly unexamined relationship to power, really? Because magic is power. I'm not going to qualify it or explain it. I'm not going to infantilize you by neutering it in any way. If you've ever conducted a pure flow of magic, there's no denying that this is power. And for most of us, power is uncomfortable. If you're going to become unambiguously magical, you need to clean up this layer of your belief system. The greater the power, the greater the responsibility. You've heard it. They move together. And I'm not talking about curbing your cringy secret desire to hex your ex-husband's new girlfriend, either. This isn't about kindergarten-level magic slogans. Use your power for good and all that. It's not about the ethics of magic. It's about power and how it will require you to use your human vehicle, your human instrument, responsibly. If your mind can increasingly conduct the power of magic, then you can no longer afford to think crappy, random, prepackaged thoughts. Imagine the level of responsibility required to only host thoughts that were aligned with your intention, with your good. Aren't we all just way too lazy and indulgent for that? Don't we all want to retain the option to indulge in a nice cold slab of worry or catastrophizing or outrage? The truth is, we can exercise control over our minds, but we don't want to. If your body increasingly becomes the conduit of more magical power, subtly conducting this power and weaving it into reality, what naff physical habits will you need to forego? If your imagination becomes the storyboard of magical power, you'll have to stop randomly imprinting it with images of suffering, death, gore, porn. You'll need to learn to cherish and protect the magical medium of your imagination. Power makes us uneasy. Power comes with a level of responsibility that means we'll have to give up our indulgences, our sloppiness, our excuses, and delay tactics. We won't be able to pretend anymore that our thoughts, our bodies, and our imaginations don't really matter, or 
only matter sometimes. We won't be able to get away with being careless with them. We all know this on some level, and so we only want a safe taste of magic, like going to the ice cream shop and getting those little sample spoons to try different flavors. Obstacle number six. Lastly, we block our magic with a bit of self-deception. You tell yourself you don't know how to cultivate your psychic abilities. It's much safer to dream about magic and talk about magic, idealize magic and fantasize about magic, and dabble in magic and learn about magic, than to become magical. So you make yourself believe you don't know how, or that the knowledge is out there, occult, it's not. But if you have to go chasing after it, then you have a perfectly good reason to make sure it doesn't just happen, because that might be inconvenient. You currently have access to whatever information you need right now to become magical. No, it's not the entire story. It's not the whole map with all the steps. It's self-delusion that makes you think that's what you need, some ultimate treatise on magic. What you need is the step that's perfect for you right now. And then in the next moment, you need that step. You need one at a time, and you always have access to the one you need right now. If you learn and practice and keep faith with this inner consultation, but the mind wants something grand and interesting and diverting, the step you need right now might be very small or subtle. But if you don't take it, you can't get the next one. You need to learn to consult yourself, not your fantasy or thoughts or wishes, but to go directly into the temple at the very center, your sacred center space, and bring forth the treasures there that are perfect for you in this moment. To do this, you'll need to create a living, daily, moment-by-moment -moment relationship with that center space. It's not something you do on the weekends or auspicious lunations. It's a way of being and living fully integrated. So we covered some of the fears and beliefs that block your magic and limit your psychic abilities. Now let's investigate some steps you can take right now to become more magical and improve your natural ultrasensory abilities. Tip number one, become intimately familiar with your energy field. What is your energy field? Learn to see it, feel it, and know what's happening within it. What's the quality of the energy? Where is it flowing? What's siphoning it away? What's crimping it off? Learn to communicate with your energy field, or what I often call the personal biosphere. How about your boundary? What is it? What state is it in? Learn to see it, to feel it, and to communicate with it. Tip number two, be silent. On this topic, developing and practicing your personal magic, be silent. Watch for any impulse from the ego to talk about it. When the impulse arises, don't simply shut it down, but notice and really examine it. What is the motive? Do you want to sound interesting? Are you seeking validation or reassurance? Are you trying to prove something? Do you need recognition? Are you trying to push back against the overculture? Are you making a statement? Look very deeply and be honest. Whatever you find is okay. Talking about magic or psychic phenomenon generally is one thing. Talking about your personal abilities, practice and development, is what I'm suggesting you reserve in silence. Not as a hard and fast rule, because there may be people with whom it's safe, healthy, and even beneficial to share or exchange ideas and experiences. But be very clear, sober, and judicious with whom you share, and especially why. You'll learn a lot about yourself, your motivations, and any insecurities, fears, and ego involvement that lie beneath the surface. When you discover them, don't judge yourself. Just notice there are other reasons to be silent, too. If you share with the wrong people for the wrong reasons, 
you can dilute your potency. Another reason is to avoid being overly influenced by others. You know, their beliefs, opinions, judgments, and worldviews, even if they're open to the idea of magic or expanded abilities. Once you've firmly established yourself as your own authority, this last point will be less of an issue because you will have developed a kind of influence-resistant coding, which will allow you to interact with the beliefs and worldviews of others without being influenced by them. But realistically, very few people have developed a closed-loop energy system. So for now, it's best to be silent. Tip number three, learn to control the predictive mind. Your mind does this really cool thing every second you're awake and sober. It predicts what's going to happen next. This is useful and important for just about every part of daily living, but it's a straitjacket for the flow of miracles. The predictive mind doesn't draw from all possible things that could happen next. It only has access to what it already knows and believes. It's also programmed to conserve energy, so it just gives you the top three options for what will happen next. So let's unpack this a bit. Your predictive mind only has access to what it knows and believes. This means it has to have experienced or known about something before, and it has to believe it. Now here's something you may not realize. You've experienced magic before, and miracles, and the anomalous. You have, and one of two things happened. Your system registered it, accepted that it was magic, and then it was overridden by your fears and insecurities and doubts and that inner gatekeeper I mentioned previously. So while part of you said yes to this, you didn't accept it with your whole being. And this results in a kind of inner dissonance where you say you believe it and claim it's true. But in fact, if I was to go into your inner filing system, I would find it filed under wishes, fantasies, and alt-reality, not under facts about my world. The other thing that happens is you experience magic, a miracle, the anomalous, and your system erases it immediately, so it never gets processed at all. It gets dumped into the repressed memory bin. In either of these cases, your predictive mind, even if it has experienced magic before, doesn't have that data filed in the areas it draws from, things it knows about and believes. Your magic and miracles are not stored in the database called facts about my world. The predictive mind doesn't solely determine what actually happens next, but it does exert an outsized influence as it stamps its framework and endorsement onto the flow of potential. And if you're actively seeking to influence your stream contrary to the predictive mind, let's face it, you're outmatched. It's tricky, but you need to practice bringing the predictive mind to a complete standstill when you're actively engaging your magic, especially if it's magic you haven't firmly established yourself in. Otherwise, the predictive mind will impose a framework for the outcome that does not include magic. Your predictive mind doesn't operate when you've taken psychedelic drugs or when you're dreaming. Now that's interesting. I'm not advocating drugs at all. I think practicing advanced dreaming is better. But as a thought experiment, examining and thinking about which states of consciousness do not contain an active predictive mind can be very revealing. Clearly, this function of mind isn't always on. Also, there are states of consciousness where we operate without it. It's clearly not necessary to run all the time. You can investigate the dreaming mind to learn what it feels like when the predictive mind isn't switched on, and you can reverse engineer that experience. I've included a link in the description to a very powerful lucid dreaming guided meditation that can help you explore your dream world. Tip number four. Uncover and face your fears about having psychic abilities. Oh goodness, just when you think you've cleaned it all up, fears, beliefs, wounds around magic come bubbling to the surface again. It's okay though, it happens in layers, and you'll keep finding older, more subtle artifacts to look at, sympathize with, and then integrate. As you move into different aspects of magic or embody it more deeply and fully, you'll encounter old programs and reflexes and impulses and worldviews and sensitive spots. 
This is great. Whenever something comes to the surface, welcome it. No matter how misshapen, unpleasant, or unflattering it appears to be, it's showing itself, and that means you can integrate the trapped energy within it. Tip number five, cultivate mental and emotional autonomy. <laughs> if you've followed me for a while, taken any of my courses, or read through my blog, you can't escape this exhortation. Wake up, grow up, deprogram, get out of default mode, clean up your energy field, learn what your moods and emotions are about, learn how to manage your energy and relationships, learn how to avoid getting hooked and courted. No excuses. Tip number six, practice daily. Practice magic daily. It's not a big deal. Don't make anything of it, but do it. For around the past decade, I've spent 15 minutes nearly every day practicing teleportation or psychokinesis. It absolutely does not matter if I teleport or move that paperclip with my mind. It's not the point. This kind of practice isn't about success or failure, cause and effect outcomes. I practice with a light heart and a sense of fun and exploration. But I'm also earnest. When I practice teleportation, for instance, I don't do it in my pajamas. I assume it will work, and there aren't many places I'd like to show up in my PJs. Now, I've never teleported, but other related abilities have become activated quite unexpectedly, and they're very interesting. I don't feel the least bit disappointed when my 15 minutes are up and I'm still in my own house. That doesn't matter. It's fruitful in many ways, and sometimes those ways don't become evident until later. Just the act of engaging with a form of magic that's outside your known abilities without judgment about results brings you into an open and playful relationship with your magic. I show up to play, and my magic plays with me too. I've learned so much doing this, and it's rewired me in a way that brings back my delight in being magical. Practicing magic that is outside the bounds of my known skill set in this way has helped me uncover residual beliefs and fears and conditions. Many of these are carried over from other lives. Doing this daily also gives me a lot of data over time about what affects my focus, my energy, and ability to conduct the flow of magic. Foods I eat, social interactions, the quality of my sleep, geographical locations and environments. I have a much better understanding of what improves or hinders my magic. So some of you might still be on the fence about magic. You might say, why bother? Why is it important to cultivate magic and psychic abilities? If magic seems whimsical to you, then I suggest you look deeper. I'm not talking about ritual magic or religious magic. I'm talking about natural magic, attuning yourself to a layer of reality where the flow, the pulse, the making of magic is natural, not fantastical. One of the benefits of cultivating your magic is healing and integration. If you were born with your magic already activated, you probably developed fears, wounds, insecurities, internalized judgment, and coping mechanisms to blunt your experience of magic or compensate for it by, for instance, becoming hyper-rational. You may have disowned aspects of yourself, powered down parts of your energy field, forcibly closed connections. Cultivating your magic is bringing yourself home. It's a form of reclaiming your magical child selves that were left behind. It may not have felt safe or comfortable to be your magical self, and so you buried it. But you're not a child anymore, and you have the ability to reclaim and reintegrate these aspects of yourself. When you do this, you'll change. It's not that you'll just be your same self with something added to you. Wholeness is more than the sum of the parts. And every time you integrate, you move toward wholeness and you change. As we move toward wholeness, it's harder for the overculture to use, confuse, or manipulate us. Cultivating our magic helps us resist enslavement. Becoming magical isn't about doing magic, it's about being magic, becoming 
And as you do this, you learn to accept more power, to carry more power, and to be more powerful, not over others, but in your own life. You become the locus of authority and responsibility in your own life. I have expressed this many times in different ways. If you're not in charge of yourself, someone or more likely something else will be. Sometimes we can see this as people, organizations, or culture overtly exercising authority and control over us. But increasingly, it's the carrot and not the stick that confounds and enslaves us. There are elements of the overculture that work actively to grind the magic out of you, to separate you entirely from that flow, to alienate you from it, in order to replace it with a product, a technology, an ideology. It exiles you from your stream of magic, and then it creates ersatz magic in the form of technology and sells these fragments back to you. The net is closing rapidly around us in ways we haven't even begun to comprehend, and we thought we were shaping it to better serve us, but it's quite the opposite. Please hear me. This is the most important thing I'm ever going to say to you. Your ability to think, to feel, to imagine, to communicate, to perceive, to connect with and know deeply yourself and others and the world around you, to know what's real, to heal and regulate yourself. This is being increasingly externalized and altered by a nearly irresistible, extrinsic, synthetic influence. We are human. We've taken that for granted, mostly. We've examined our human condition through biology, archaeology, psychology. But now we're tasked with finding out what being human actually means. What does it mean to be human? What's at the heart of it? Where does your humanity reside? And what does it feel like? What shapes can it take? What is its real value and potential? And how can you preserve it against the synthetic influence? How can you become fully human. This is a deep and broad inquiry, and I believe it includes reclaiming the messy, unknown, hard to codify streams of magic and integrating the rational, linear, time-bound layer of our realities with the magical. The conflict between these two realities is entirely fabricated. There is only unity, and perhaps an important part of our humanity is the expression and full embodiment of this unity. And that's why I propose that fully embodying your own magic and strengthening your connection to your source of creation is essential, not whimsical. Resist being overpatterned. Resist being shaped according to the synthetic external force. Resist beguilement. Resist enslavement. Do you ever feel stranded in a world without magic? Sometimes the real world feels a bit too real. I was chatting with someone about magic and miracles being commonplace, and she stomped her pretty little foot and cried definitively, No, they're not. Well, perhaps you can relate. There are times when we feel like the mundane world is all there is. It's so heavy and so demanding and so consuming. Kind of get beached on the gritty shores of no magic. We've all been there. Real magic isn't an escape from reality. It is reality beneath the superficial layers. But sometimes those surface layers of reality can exert a morbid iron grip on your attention focus and energy field. Now, I can't say for certain whether all people have a connection to magic. I know there are some who confidently claim that everyone has access to the stream of magic. I don't know. But what I can say confidently is that many people I've met over the years have unclaimed abilities. When these abilities break through the surface, their minds either erase the memory of it or file it somewhere other than facts about my world. It's diminished and forgotten. 
You may have had many such experiences. So the issue isn't that you don't have access or abilities. The problem is you can't maintain awareness of them. We mistakenly believe we have an accurate chronological memory of what happens in our lives when our mind is constantly editing. It fills in the blanks, literally just making things up in order to make the world conform to our expectations and beliefs. It also deletes things for the same reason. Cultivating your magic can be challenging. You've got to dissolve your fears, your beliefs, and blocks. And sometimes you know what they are, but many remain outside of your awareness. You have to get to know the predictive mind and discover ways to master it, all while contending with the pervasive grid of overculture, always at work to overpattern your true nature. How about some help with that? If you've worked with my audio spells on this channel, you know they're powerful and deeply supportive. But I also have a private library with more advanced audio spells, and I've created a two-hour audio specifically to help you bring more magic into your life, and you'll find the link in the description. So, do you experience any of the blocks I talked about? What are your favorite ways to get unblocked and cultivate your magic? Let me know in the comments. Until next time, watch for the miracles.